Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today we're talking to Max Grew from Intrepid and Larger, oh, Intrepid Cameras, uh, <laughs> who's coming out with a Kickstarter uh, very soon about a compact and larger. Uh, if you don't know, Intrepid, it makes uh, four by five, five by seven, eight by 10 uh, large format cameras. And they released a four by five uh, in larger module, like a light module uh, a couple of years back. And now they're coming out with their first medium format dip. So Max, welcome. Hey, Nico, thanks for having me. So tell us, what do we have here uh, for this new in Intrepid venture? So this is our, yeah, our second enlarger, as you mentioned. So it's a compact enlarger for 35 millimeter and 120. It goes up to six by nine on the uh, negative size. And basically it's sort of a fully featured traditional enlarger, but instead of coming on a massive stand and taking up a load of room in your house, if you wanted to print it at home, you can clip it onto a tripod or a copy stand and then everything packs away when you're done. So there's sort of nothing it can't do, but it just works in a slightly different way. And one of the other cool things that it does is because it uses um, completely modern technology, LEDs that were only invented a couple of years ago, you can also use it as a scanner with a digital camera by uh, popping the back off the enlarger and using that as a backlight for your negatives. Um, okay. It comes with a timer to control everything. And on that, you've got built-in contrast filters, built-in cyan, magenta, and yellow filters for color printing, and also a mode for scanning that produces a light that's uh, perfectly balanced for scanning negatives. Okay, so for those who are, yeah, basically maybe heard of darkroom work, let's, like, I'm going to break it down as simple as could mm -hmm. be. This is basically a holder, light source, and a computer, let's say, for your enlarger. So uh, the holder holds your film. So basically, it's like if you were scanning with an Epson, you're, like, holding your negatives into it, like a negative holder. And then you slide it into uh, the enlarger. You have the light sources, this little small end at the back, which is very, very small because as you said, you're using LED um, technology, mm -hmm. which doesn't have the light bulb and the heating and the fan and all that stuff mm -hmm. uh, that's usually, you know, in a traditional enlarger. And then the front, you just put a enlarger lens, which usually uses the M39 screw, which is like the like a, a thread mount. Uh, funny enough, that's I think that's how they actually started doing that. So you just uh, screw that on, and I'll do an camera angle number two so Max can see it, but you guys are already seeing it. So this is basically your enlarger now. And then it has the computer part, which is the controller, which is pretty cool, I have to say. Um, it ha gives me like the do-it-yourself vibe right now, which I this is a beta unit, so I don't know. If these yeah, it's a prototype, yeah. Exactly, it's a prototype, so guys don't judge it too much. <laughs> and here you have like different controls. You have the uh, contrast control, then you have like the three for color. So it's uh, cyan, if I'm not wrong, magenta and yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it in Spanish, so if I make a mistake, that's my bad. And then you mm -hmm. can add times and do all kinds of funky stuff. Like, so like you can have like, this is to like test your light so you guys can see the beam of light. This lens is full of fungus. So whoever spots <laughs> that, that's the way because I picked a different lens so you can turn it on and off. So that's just white light to like focus and work with your enlarger. And then once mm -hmm. you have some time, you can be like, I want, that was super short. So let's add like a minute or a second, sorry. And that would be like your light, depending on the contrast, that's contrast number one. If we do like contrast number five, it should be like magenta-ish. So it's different oh, on blue. LED because it's um, projecting light instead of filtering light. Uh, you're basically changing the blue and green values only, which is works actually the same way that multi-grade filters work. But the multi-grade filters have red dye in them as well. But because the paper's not sensitive to red, the paper only actually sees the blue and green element coming out. Okay. So it's actually working in the same way as what the paper sees, but the human eye sees the light slightly differently, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's To me, it's more like, I want to understand it as if I was totally new to this because mm -hmm, to me, mm -hmm. one of the biggest questions about your, your new and larger is what the target audience is. Yeah. And I'm guessing it's not people like me who already have a dark room, an eight by 10 color and larger, you know, I have like the whole suit of, or, you know, the whole setup already. It might be more for someone that started shooting film a couple of years ago, enjoys shooting and scanning and all this. And I've been seeing yeah. other people enlarging and are like, oh, wait, that could be super cool. And I really like the idea that you could do black and white and color because color heads are easy to find. But sometimes, you know, the colors might be off or like the controlling understanding color is hard. 
So this mm -hmm. makes it kind of like all built in one. So you can, yeah. like one of the worst parts of color enlarging, and this is what I do, is the control dials on the enlarger head. Like having it on a little computer screen, and I say computer because this is like a mini computer basically, yeah. is pretty cool. And now I don't know how to change the mode. This is when Max it's will the, call me out. <laughs> the button on the right hand side at the bottom, the gray one. That's it. Okay, so now we're in color. So now whenever I spin this, I can see the numbers. Uh, you guys can't see it, but like 56, cyan, and magenta, and yellow. Like, yeah. it's so easy to change. Um, so yeah, what do you think is going to be the target for you? Because this is my idea of it, but I would love to hear your idea yeah, of you're, who's the target. You're, you're pretty much right. So the target is, it's anyone who has sort of been shooting film for a little bit, or maybe just got into shooting film. They've done a bit of scanning their negatives but they haven't experienced sort of the second half of shooting film, which is actually what the negatives were designed to do, which is making prints from them. And a lot of people like myself live in a tiny flat, don't have access to a dark room that easily. So this product is for someone who wants to just easily convert their bathroom or a cupboard or kitchen or wherever into a mini dark room, and then have the ability to pack everything away when you're done. And you don't have this massive bulky enlarger just set up on a table somewhere the whole time. Another thing about us doing it is a lot of enlargers that you might be able to get now are second hand. Maybe you need to find some spare parts, which are really hard to find on some brands of enlarger. The companies that used to make those enlargers don't necessarily exist in the same way that they did before. You can't really get support. Whereas we're a company that's existed for since 2014. We're coming up with new products. We're here to support you. You could buy this kit and not know how to use it at all. And then you can call us and we'll teach you how to make prints. We're going to do some guide videos. So if you want to get into printing for the first time, I think this is a much better way to do it because you can have the support from us. It's easy to, easy to use and you can create uh, prints just as good as any other enlarger kit and it's not going to permanently take up a load of space in your house. So that's sort of the target really. Yeah, I mean, to give some perspective, you either can buy an enlarger new, which can cost up to like a thousands a couple of pounds or euros or dollars, whatever mm -hmm. currency you're using. You can buy a secondhand one, which usually will be like at least a fourth of that. Uh, sometimes you get lucky. And then you can get freebies, mm -hmm. which uh, they're not mm -hmm. so common anymore. People used to get rid of them very easily, but people have noticed that there's a value in enlargers and darkroom gear. So like this, I think is that is a very small portable way to like get into it. And what it does is basically it's an all in one that you can do the contrast, which means you don't have to get the under the filter uh yeah. like filter holder and you don't have to use the little ones that are on the top of the enlarger which are like square and then you can't find the one you want even though they do still sell them um that part is covered paper uh filters and chemistry but the mm -hmm. enlarger lenses and all this is a bit sometimes a little harder to find so yeah i like the idea just for reference like it's extremely small like it fits in the palm of your hand and this like max said before you just need a tripod uh copy stand or even an all-in larger that you can take off the head and put this on because maybe you don't yeah. have parts or maybe you just want to have something that's easier to break down and put away. So that's what I like. And the idea of the LED, how strong is it compared to let's say like a six by seven and larger? Because I'm not super keen on voltages and vats and more. Yeah, of course. So um, we've been comparing it with so in the darkroom we've been able to use for the prototyping after the last year, we've been comparing it with a Devere uh, 504. Devere are actually based just down the road from us, their sort of repair shop, which has been useful to have some help from them, and a Durst color in larger. Um, the, I can't remember what Durst is. It's the one that goes up six by seven and has color on the head. And the Maybe, times uh, of the Durst, the times of the Durst are pretty much comparable, and it's twice as fast printing time as the Devere, but because that's a four by five larger, I think it's got a slightly weaker uh, light. Um, contrast wise, uh, the contrast results from the Intrepid larger and the Devere are exactly the same. You can't, you can barely notice the difference between between them, and the same with sharpness. And it, it works just as well as an enlarger. The, the only thing that's different is um, setup time, yeah. really. So, and, and talking about setup time, which is something that concerns. I think some people like you could leave it permanently set up like I have my darkroom and work with it. You could uh, break it down and set it up. Like what would you say is an average time to like go from toilet to dark toilet, basically? 
toilet to dark toilet to light. considering <laughs> you have like a flat like a flat surface and yeah, yeah, yeah. you have like like you don't have to like set up a table and whatnot like let's <laughs> say you put it on your you know copy stand or a tripod level it yeah. and also you put a little level on it this is a prototype so i'm not sure this yeah. is the final version but i think the interesting part is the back of it is metallic probably for heat diffusion and yeah. uh, this is probably magnetic, or at least you can put like a level on top, even if it's not magnetic. Exactly. Yeah. Like so I have a little construction one, and you can just put it on top and level it that way. Mm -hmm. so what the top is there? machined. The top is machined flat specifically, so you can use a level. I'd actually recommend using a level over the spirit levels we've included. And the Android and iPhones have that leveling app built in, so you can just rest yeah. the phone on top. And if it says zero, then you're good. Then you just rest the phone on what you're projecting onto and if that says yeah. there as well yeah well, you kind of got in parallel i have to say being a phone geek myself like the camera bumps are so big that doesn't work anymore because i have an iphone yeah. something right yeah, now. yeah you have to pop and, the camera yeah. bit off yeah yeah that like the, the camera <laughs> module is like bigger than the enlarger you sell you know it's yeah, like know. it's so big so yeah like it, it's true that you can do that and i same thing like i don't recommend bubble levels in any camera i don't care if it's a cnr or chamonix yeah, yeah. carpet because they're always going to be either they could be right, but they could be wrong. So yeah, yeah. A normally a I think dedicated that, one is better. The best, yeah. And you can get them for like five pounds on eBay. And yeah, just rest it on the top, rest it on the thing. Get them to read the same thing. Another uh, method, which you actually came up with when you were testing our four by five enlarger attachment was to project onto graph paper or onto a cutting mat. And then you mm -hmm. can sort of forget the four corners square. So let's think total setup time of getting your bathroom, dark room set up. You're looking sort of between 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, mixing all yeah. the chemicals, getting a Oh, yeah, trays. but that, that's going to be the same wherever you're going. Like, to exactly. Me, it's, it's going yeah. from like, okay, I have a dedicated enlarger. I pick it up from the floor. It's heavy. It hurts my back. I put it on yeah. the counter. I yeah. plug it in. I put the timer. I plug it in. And that's basically it. I don't have to do anything else because the enlarger, mm -hmm. even though they do get also, uh, you know, kicked off from like calibration or what, how do you say, mm -hmm. like, you know, parallax or parallel. So they yeah. usually have like little things that you can like fix it because sometimes it gets broken or moved, but like the, this has that added time because you have to screw it on. Yeah. I have my tripod plate here, which I was going to do like a little demo, but like, I think it's just people understand that this yeah. is, has a screw on the bottom here with the metallic, uh, basically a metallic U and you just screw that on and put it on your tripod or, you yeah. know, re reproduction. I think stand. you're looking at, you're looking at sort of five minutes if that added to your darkroom setup time which is already half an hour it's once you look at how long it takes to get set up to get printing so yeah let's say about half an hour it's kind of an insignificant addition of time and once you've got it set up parallel and got it all locked in you know it's you're using a tripod or a copy stand you trust them with your camera to get that all zeroed out and you trust it to stay stable so there's no reason why it wouldn't work for this as well it's the same gear so it i mean i've been testing this all year and i've really like you almost don't think about the setup time. It's just once you're used to doing it, it's really not a big problem at all. And it's very easy to get everything parallel. Yeah. And you can see when you're using the focus finder, if something's not sharp on one edge and then you make an adjustment and it's really not, um, it's not a barrier to enjoying using an enlarger. It's having oh. to clip it on a tripod first. I've never leveled my enlarger. That's something I can confess. <laughs> and uh, I know I know the Naked Photographer uh, YouTube channel, uh, Gregory, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong, uh, he would be very upset at me, but yeah, I never, like, I, I have the laser one that you put like the thing and I never fixed it because one of the cables is wrong. Um, <clears> it's like broken, but yeah, basically I've never had an issue. And also usually you stop down your lens to like F8, yeah. F11, and that should fix yeah, some exactly. of that. So, but I, I think people get too concerned. One of the things I've heard online about the, the design is the fact that the a focus knob is on the front here. And like you mm -hmm. would have your hand in front of the lens, which I so guess you just uh, have to put it on the reversible. side. Reversible. You can use it on the front or the back. If you notice that there's two oh. screws on the back, you can yeah. take the focus out, the two rails out, and then they pop in the other way and you can have it. So it goes whichever way you want it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that you can basically like remove the front. And yeah, yeah. That's yeah everything's cool. on bearing. So it just pops off and you spin it around and whichever way. It depends how big you're printing, really. If you're doing really big prints, it might be useful to have it at the bottom. If you're doing little prints, like 35 mil up to five by seven, it would make more sense to have it at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things that's cool that you mentioned is the bellows are magnetic. So like you can basically mm -hmm. remove this 
and uh, you know, I'm guessing use it for the scanning part, which yeah. So the back just comes off. I've got one here actually. So you just yeah, you loosen these two, mm -hmm. and the bellows come off. And this comes off the back. And you have and the light source. Light source, and then it's machined flat on the back, so you rest it on surface. Negative sits in there, and then you take a picture with your camera set up there. Yeah, and I mean the light source is calibrated, so you don't have to do as much color balance um, work in Lightroom or whatever you're using. Makes it a lot simpler. Yeah, I would I would say like it's cool that it has that third feature. You like mm -hmm. like a black and white head, color head, and it, uh, scanning. But I would say the film holders are not meant to be doing like, you know, a hundred rolls in a day. It's like, no, you know, like no, no, no. I need to scan quickly. I got a couple shots I really like. Like I, that, to me, it's comparable to when you're enlarging. You never enlarge the whole roll. So yeah, like, exactly. you'll do a contact sheet. You'll pick which ones you like. And then you enlarge two or three tops, at least in my case. I'm not that good of a photographer, I guess. Um, <laughs> but and same thing with scanning. Like I would love to be able to preview. And I, these preview apps that are coming out, like Cinestill made that uh, Instagram filter that basically previews. Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Then the Film Lab app, which uh, from Developing Fix, Abe Fettig, uh, has mm -hmm. one on your phone that's free and you can also preview. So I think that's the best Yeah, case. so that's what we've been using. We've been using the Film Lab app. And it's really, if you don't have a lot, because a lot of dark rooms, you need a light box to like preview your negatives before you make a contact sheet. So you can also just use it like that. You can just kind of quickly hold your negatives up to a window or a light, see which ones you like, and then use your phone to quickly invert it, have a look whether it looks decent on your screen, and then you know you want to print that one. So it's just adding functionality, but all in the same package rather than having to go out and find all these extra accessories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, talking about accessories, we were talking about the enlarger and how price-wise, you know, you can buy new enlargers for a couple grand and whatnot secondhand. One of the things that people don't know is many times you buy an enlarger or you get one and the you need an f-stop clock or stop clock or anything like that and that becomes uh sometimes a mission on its own to find the one you want the one you like mm -hmm. with the features the fact that you guys include uh basically the timer and control box in this little uh extra bit is super cool because in one shop all you need is a lens and something to hold the whole enlarger up, which could be multiple devices. Yeah, which most people have a tripod anyway. So yeah, and you can buy these travel tripods. I've got like a Manfrotto B free, which is pretty. Yeah, you know, it's flimsy, but it works. On. Yeah, it's flimsy, yeah. but it works well enough that it holds the camera still. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what's the time frame for the enlarger? Uh, I know the Kickstarter has a date, uh, which is, <laughs> I think, March, uh, end of March. March 19th, March 19th, so next Friday, where the pens when this goes out, but yeah, March 19th, at 6 p.m. GMT. The whole and team will be in the workshop, having uh, a beer, waiting for it to launch, socially yeah, distance, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody at a distance. And then <laughs> yeah, yeah. the idea for shipping, what's your time schedule, basically? So this is our fourth Kickstarter, and it's by far the furthest along the production process we've been when launching a Kickstarter. We saw already a, like a year into production. Um, the prototype you've got there, I've got sort of the, the next version along here that I just showed. Um, so we've got a few tweaks to make based on user feedback. Uh, the design and the controller might change a bit, but we're, you know, we're not far off a finished product here, particularly in terms of the technology that's in the thing is pretty much finished, which is the hardest part. Yeah. So depending on how well the Kickstarter does, or even if it's successful at all, we're mostly just using it to, to sort of double check our theory that there is a market for this product and it's worth setting up a whole production line for, because obviously that's a lot of work. And then as a thank you for people helping us with that market research, we give it to them for a better price than it would be available on the website. Um, so yeah, in terms of actually when we'll be shipping, haven't got anything firm, but it'll definitely be sort of, We'll be looking at getting things out sort of late summer, early autumn. It should be, you know, a good sort of yeah. four, six it, months after the Kickstarter campaign. But it's impossible. It's so hard to say. And I don't want to put any firm things in it. We'll have a timeline. But everyone who has used Kickstarter knows that people commit to timelines and then it goes. But sideways. you never know how many you're going to sell. So you don't like <laughs> timelines will change depending on how well the Kickstarter does. So it's a bit bizarre. You have to put a timeline at the beginning. But yeah. what I will say is, We've always delivered on our Kickstarter campaigns. This is our fourth one. We keep in constant contact with people when we're doing it. 
and we've never been this close to a finished product before when we've launched. So I'm fingers crossed that this one should be pretty smooth. I mean, I'll say from the user standpoint, uh, as a darkroom user, is like winter is when you don't want to go outside so much. So it's a good time. If if it gets to people around the darker time of the year, and maybe I'm only talking for the Northern Hemisphere, so sorry for the South guys. Uh, but yeah, like I would be happy if it gets to me November, December, and I'm going to be in Finland. So like, it'll be pitch dark by then and I can enlarge in the garden if I want. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, like I think that's a good, I mean, and I do know, like you said, it's your fourth Kickstarter. You've, you've sent stuff multiple times. You have like a team, people working. It's not like you have to set up, oh, wait, this is super successful. I need to hire people that know how to do this. Nah, there's, there's 10 of us. We know what we're doing. I feel quietly confident this time. How, Actually, how, I'm not being that quiet about it. I'm how, so confident this time. <laughs> yeah. How funny? How fun is it to make micro bellows? Do you know what James? So he met before James, who is the head of production and also makes the bellows. He loves them. He's like, like he cuts them out and then he does this and it's done. Like yeah. compared to the eight by ten bellows, yeah, the eight which by is ten, a, which is much bigger. It's like an hour sitting there with cramps in your hands. This is just like done. Okay. So, yeah, and it's pretty I, easy. Slightly technical questions, and I'm not super technical person myself, but I'll ask mm-hmm. something that I would love to ask just anyone is like, what are the maximum sizes you can enlarge? Which is probably one of those questions that people are. One thing I'll say for those who are getting into darkroom is bigger is not better in the darkroom because you'll better. really dislike big prints. And I'm the first one that got into the darkroom thinking, oh, I'll make 50 by 60 centimeter yeah. prints or 20 by 24 for those in the in the other scale, uh, like big prints. And like then you start doing mixing chemistry and the space you need and the counters and the paper yeah, costs yeah, yeah. and all this. And you're like, whoa, eight by tens are beautiful. <laughs> so <laughs> so like yeah. if I, I had to ask like that, like from 35 mil, I'm I'm sure you can print pretty much any size but like six by seven or six by nine which is a bigger nag uh what would you say is the biggest it's been designed with people printing up to sort of 11 by 14 as large as between five by seven 11 by 14 for all mm-hmm. formats is how it's been but it's the same with our other enlarger like the light source is really powerful so if you do want to make like a massive print and project on the wall you can do that if you want but because it's a compact and larger, we're imagining people printing in smaller spaces. I think 11 by 14 is like an easy, comfortable maximum size. Yeah. And I would imagine, particularly like so eight by 10 is the easiest paper to find. There's loads of it, it's cheap, you get massive box of it. If you're learning to print, eight by 10 is such a nice size yeah. to print on. And, and then what... it's a nice size to like hang on the wall as well and give us a gift. Like, yeah. yeah, I always say the example of big prints when you give them to family members, they're always like, what am I going to do with an 11 5, 14 <laughs> family picture? Like, I, I, I'm going to have to hang it somewhere. Like, yeah, I want to put it on top of the chimney yeah. or in the fridge. Like, give me a 5 by 7 anytime. Um, and also, for people to understand, you can change the size of your print, not so much with the enlarger, but the, the enlarger height. So you can use a tripod mm-hmm. higher. You can use a reproduction exactly. stand a little higher. Like you, Max, said, you can project to the wall um you can also change the lens so like if you're enlarging for example 35 usually the normal lens is a 50 but if you're like oh wait that makes the enlarger be super low you can uh change it to an 80 mil and put the enlarger a little higher also we'll add time which will be nicer if you're dodge and burning so those are like mm-hmm. all darkroom perks that you learn as you go um yep. like i've learned the hard way basically um so yeah, I, I really like the idea. I think people will be pretty excited. I was looking at the preview of the Kickstarter, which I won't share any numbers or things because I know it's a preview and things can change last minute. But like you guys are not asking for a tremendous amount. I don't know if that's public or you want to talk about like what the goal is. Because... We've got the yeah, the goal is so the goal is twenty thousand pounds, which is enough for us to set up the production line and know that it's worth investing in this product. So the the prices we want to sell the product at only makes sense at scale if you can't like there's a lot of electronics in it you can't really approach a pcb manufacturer and be like i want 50 of these they're just gonna say no so so then you have to look at doing it yourself which is even more expensive so we need to sell a few of them to make it viable because it's so much more of an electronics based project than Mm -hmm. we've done our cameras um and then, yeah, there's a cost in set. We have to set up a new production line, which, you know, is this just tables and screwdrivers and parts bins and things and a bit of training for everyone. So it's not too complicated, not too yeah. expensive. And what would you say is the biggest challenge 
so far for this project. I mean, we do understand, uh, I think everybody knows that it's already built and it's uh, like you said, at 95% finished basically. Yeah, it's not, it's not far. Uh, working prototype here. I know you've sent a bunch to people on uh, social media and I'll say social mm -hmm. media, but like YouTube and Instagram yeah. and whatnot. So like uh, what's been the hardest part to develop this? Because I would say the filtering, uh, but yeah. you tell me. Yeah, you're right, it's the filtering, yeah. Um, so before the project started, um, the, yeah, right at the beginning of the project, when this was an idea a few years ago, the LED technology didn't, that this uses didn't exist. Um, so learning how that technology works, learning PCB design. So we learned how to design the circuitry and everything in-house. So we now can do that, which is great for future projects as well. Learning how to write the code that the uh, control box uses. Something again we learned in house that took ages, but it's something we know how to do now, which is great sort of for the company as a whole to have that knowledge for product development. But yeah, working out the filtering um, was complicated, particularly from my experience. Uh, contrast filtering, like we mentioned earlier, you see the projected light and it's sort of a magenta or yellow light, but this, but then you have to look at like what wavelengths the paper is actually seeing and then figure out, oh, actually you need to use blue and green and kind of getting over all those little hurdles in your head. But once you sort of understand how the paper works and how it's not too complicated and what light it's expecting to see for different contrast things that, it all kind of came together quite quickly in the, for the last few months. So yeah, we've learned a lot, but it's been a very fun product to develop because you spend all the time in the darkroom. So it's been great. Oh yeah, darkroom time is always good. Um, yeah. One of the things I'm, I'm sure that making the four by five in larger module uh, has helped in you know designing most mm -hmm. of this because you already have the know-how of working with LEDs and like the heat yeah. dissipation and so far. This is something that has nothing to do with this Kickstarter, but like I would say like getting out of the Kickstarter in Intrepid is like you guys implemented the color, uh, the contrast into this. Will we see a uh, four by five version two, which will have basically the same technology because I'm guessing it's just scaling up this size to the, the four by five. Absolutely. If the Kickstarter goes well and we can sort of invest in this technology, then yeah, absolutely. It'll make its way to the four by five and then the five by seven and larger and eight by 10 and larger that we're also working on. They're a bit more complicated because they're huge. But apart from that, yeah, the, um, we want, if this goes well, I see the future being intrepid known just as much for our darkroom products as our photography products. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna ask about the eight by 10, five by seven. I know everybody wants one. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I'm negative in this way and maybe I am having an eight by 10 and larger. I'll say once you print eight by 10 a couple of times then you start fe feeling like, okay, maybe I didn't really wanna get this route because it's like, <laughs> it's such a big piece of film. Depth of field is so yep. small. Same as when you're yeah. taking pictures, dust is your worst enemy. Yeah, like yeah. holding it parallel and like I can imagine like a uh, intrepid and I'm saying intrepid eight by ten because I'm guessing it'll be some sort of like you know you know invention between your camera and your light source as an enlarger. Quite possibly, like getting yeah. everything square, just I I would like sweat like thinking about doing all that. <laughs> and not that I don't think you guys are capable, but I don't know if I'm as a consumer would be capable of like putting myself through that. I think yeah, it's definitely gonna be as with eight eight by ten everything the complications are just magnified and magnified, but yeah. there's, we get asked for it all the time. And if people want to try it out then, and we can provide it affordably, then mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to give it a go. Um, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I, I know people will, will be asking everywhere and I'm, I'm very curious for years, yeah. <laughs> whenever you launch it, like what will be the response a year after like of the, every user being like, yeah, it was great. I'm not going to use it anymore, you know, because it's just too much. And that's what happens with 8x10 <laughs> sometimes. But yeah, like, so people understand uh, this is basically a medium format. It's the first medium format product you offer mm -hmm. that won't do anything that's sheet film. Uh, how's the feeling of making something, you know, away from your usual, uh, let's say, crowd? And everybody shoots film, shoots a bit of everything. But like, how does it mm -hmm. feel to do that? It's really exciting to be working on something that is specifically designed for 35 mil and medium format users. Um, like you said, every, there's so much crossover. There's people I see who I know from the large format world who also, there's very few large format photographers who just shoot large formats. There's a lot of uh, crossover, but yeah, it's been really fun to sort of, it's opened up uh, sort of intrepid to a much wider world. I think, 
a sort of, sort of a small sample size survey that says large formats, roughly around 7% of the analog world. So it's been really nice to be able to talk to the people in the other sort of 93% or whatever it is and have so much, like the, as the company's always sort of thrived on user feedback and being able to work with the community and to have some sort of new people coming in and being able to talk to them and get their feedback and sort of realize that darkroom printing is something that a lot of people are interested in, but don't necessarily feel like they've had access to. It's been, yeah, it's been really rewarding to be able to work with a lot of new people on this. Yeah, I mean, I think the void in, in like the enlarged, like the darkroom side of analog photography should be covered, you know, better. And that's something mm -hmm. I know Ilford uh, also shares because of course they do three different products, as I like to call them, is the chemistry, the film, and the paper. And most people mm -hmm. are using one product only, and uh, maybe yeah. two if they develop at home, but like the paper side is like another uh, business for them. It's a third of their business, basically. Probably not yeah. in revenue, but you know, in number of products. So yeah, I think it's very cool. I think the idea that you can set it up in a small bathroom, you could travel with it. And I'll say travel because this is like when <laughs> When RZ Mago made the lab box and they were developing in the park, it was like, yeah, I don't know how many people are going to develop in a dusty park, you know, <laughs> but like I could see myself like if I was going for, you know, uh, you know, Erasmus or whatever exchange for yeah, like six sure. months yeah. to live in Berlin and try and I'm not in that age, but you know, if I was in that age, I'd be like, hey, I'll just take this with me and set up my tripod in the dark room and print whatever I'm doing. So I like the idea that it's small. Um, Anything else you would add to this that maybe I haven't asked you, Max, that you would like to share or, you know, cover? I think one thing I'd really like to share with people who are sort of not sure about whether darkroom printing is for them, but they've really enjoyed shooting film is just to, that for me personally, I sort of was on that frame. Like I never really thought about using the darkroom. And then once I started printing, my negatives, it completely changed the way I thought about my photography. Mm -hmm. So if you are sort of been shooting film for a little bit and you are sort of looking for the next part of your sort of photographic experience, I would just highly recommend, whether you back us on Kickstarter or not, or just get something else, just I would highly recommend trying out the darkroom, trying making prints from your negatives because it will completely change the way you look at your photography. Shooting for the print is how analog photography was originally designed to work anyway. So yeah, I would just highly recommend giving uh, giving making prints in the darkroom a go. Yeah, and one thing I'll mention to those that might be like, oh, eight by 10 or four by five, or like you could start with this and do contact prints, which I think is one of the most beautiful parts of, uh, of printing is contact mm -hmm. prints have retain all the detail. There's no mm -hmm. enlargement, mm -hmm. so you don't lose any like, you know, grays or highlights or blacks or anything. And like this uh, with a eight by 10 doing contact prints eight by 10, like we were saying the, the, the eight by 10 size as a final print is amazing and the details stunning. So I, that's one of the things I probably would use this. Like I have your prototype. I probably try to make it work for the rest of my life if I can. Uh, and I'll set it up as a, as a contact sheet, like uh, area. So I'll just have like a little copy stand on the wall, probably yeah. like screw it to the wall. So it just lives on the wall. <laughs> I don't have to set it up. And then I'll just print like contact print. So it'll be like my eight by tens. I'll just be like, okay, I want to do color, put it onto color module and or color program and do color uh, contact yeah. prints or black and white too. Like, I think that for that, it's amazing. Like I have an eight by 10, like I said, doing contact prints would mean like I've got to change the lens. I got to take out the film yeah, holder, yeah, yeah. like all these things, but like having a little dedicated one for this would be fun. So like, even if you shoot large format, this can be a complete great like tool. And it's not that Max has told me to say that this is me myself. No, I hadn't really thought about that. That's actually a really good idea. Is I actually bought a 35 mil enlarger for that. Like, just for that yeah just for that i was like i'm just gonna have one that i have like set up the marks where i know like this is the size yeah. i need to go for eight by ten this is the size i would like for four by five because contact printing is to me yeah it's like the ultimate like way to see eight by ten like i don't like enlarging eight by ten like i mentioned so like doing quick like turn around you know like in develop and i can shoot develop and print an eight by ten if i had an enlarger that's set up already in like under an hour probably mm -hmm. So maybe a little bit more, an hour and a half. And like, that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, like it's fun and small and lightweight and inexpensive probably. So we don't know prices, but can you give a rough, like what it won't be? Let's yeah, go to that. It, it, it won't be more than 300. We're 
we're like working, we're just trying to get some sort of final quotes in from suppliers, f figure out an idea of demand so we know how much of each part we're ordering. But we're aiming, as with everything we do, we're, we're not like, Intrepid have never been in this to make the big bucks. We always provide, <laughs> we always provide our products for, a, you know, a really reasonable price. So this is going to work in the same way. Uh, yeah. We're looking at sort of between 220 and 280 pounds, something like that. So yeah, the cheap, a very cheap, I don't think you can get a color and black and white with built-in filtration in larger, new, cheaper. The one we were comparing it to, the DeVere, which has a multi-grade head built in, the power, a replacement power supply just for the multi-grade head costs more than our entire and larger kit will cost. So it's a great first step if you haven't got the space or the budget for a big new and larger and don't want to work with a second hand and larger that doesn't necessarily work properly and needs a bit of repair. And, and, stuff like that. and going to the, let's say the other side of the, of the viewer is like, okay, this feels too cheap and flimsy. What would you say to those people? So the actual mechanics of the thing, I mean, you can see it there. It's got a lot more metal work on it than a lot of our products. It all runs on IGUS bearings and linear rails, which are the same type you would see in sort of a high-end CNC machine. Um, it, everything is sort of held together with way more bolts and metal than it needs to be to keep everything parallel over the long term. Um, so the actual physical module itself, once you've got it leveled, the thing is very much sort of made to be parallel and zeroed out and so once it, the error will be introduced by not spending you know quite enough time sort of your five minutes making sure everything's level the product itself is solid and um yeah will work well in the dark room yeah i i think i mean price wise i don't think one could compare like okay i bought a devere for i don't know two thousand pounds and i bought this for 300 pounds like this one's much better like i i think it's it's comparing one thing to the others doesn't make sense like yeah exactly I, yeah. I think it brings other benefits to to the table one thing i will mention also is like the fact that i've always told you like you guys are too cheap uh <laughs> i think you guys should make things a little bit more expensive and sometimes change materials not that it's bad i think 3d is still very good quality and it's improved a ton over the years i have the black uh mark four i think it's black edition and that thing mm -hmm. feels very solid compared to the, some of the previous ones. And it's it's basically all 3D printed mostly in metal parts and bearings. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people will be wondering is you guys are based in the UK. We've had mm -hmm. the, the this year, 2021, has brought in uh, a new economic, you know, idea. Well, not idea. I'd say, uh, you know, how do you say status to the UK? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How does this change things for people buying around the world uh especially i guess europe but let's say worldwide sure. can you like explain because this is probably your daily issue <laughs> and i think people will want to know hey i want to buy this intrepid and larger but yeah it's i don't know 250 pounds but then how much will customs be like can you break it down and i'll make sure i'll timestamp this so people can read it <laughs> and sure. listen to it so yeah i mean it's been as you know, because I complain to you over WhatsApp constantly about <laughs> how much hassle yeah. this has all been. But we've got our head around it now. Um, so yeah, if you're buying from outside the EU, like US or Australia, Canada, Japan, wherever, it's exactly the same as it was before. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, for the EU, it kind of operates in a similar way to if they were buying from, say for example, if you bought a lens from Japan, it now kind of works in a similar way from buying from the UK. So you don't pay VAT at checkout. You pay it when the item arrives um, in your border. That will change slightly on July when the limits go up. Um, so we'll have to double check on what the EU agrees with the UK then. Um, but basically, we'll do everything we can to make the process as smooth as possible. Um, we've been shipping all of this with DHL, who we've been working on. So that's they've been great. Everything's kind of done via text or email, so you don't get all this paperwork through. There will be the customs broker charge, which I think is around nine euros for most countries. Some it's a bit more, some it's a bit less. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you've ever bought, if you're in Europe and you've ever bought anything from Japan, the US, something like that, it's kind of a similar process. But what I would say is it's for January, it was all a bit chaotic as everyone worked out. It, was going. it is now in our experience, it's got a lot smoother. It's a lot easier and it's not really too much of a hassle. There's no higher expense apart from this little brokerage fee because you're paying what you would have paid before, but now you're just paying the VAT element when it arrives. Yeah. But now oh. they've made that so simple, you can do it by email or text. So it's it's a lot better than it was. I'm 
it's still not as good as it was before we left unfortunately but yeah it's, nothing it's, we can do with that happened. there's nothing uh, we can do about it unfortunately yeah yeah one thing i will say because i live in spain most people don't know that but um here in spain uh just to give a reference it's what you said like i would buy without the vat uh, the problem is I'll pay that fee, which in Spain is 15 euros. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I have to pay taxes, which is 21% on the item itself, plus the shipping. So it adds the shipping to the cost of the unit. And then it's mostly the time, like Spanish customs. And this is not like mm -hmm. because of Brexit. It's not because of COVID. It's just Spanish incompetence. And I'm Spanish myself, so it's not that I'm insulting a different community i'm insulting myself too is it'll take <laughs> up to two months to like get things through sometimes and i know dhl yeah. i think is a great move for you guys because yeah DHL, so they do it all themselves do, yeah so they, it's just rapid yeah yeah they speed it like, up i mean we sh we shipped that to you and it took what like two three days or something like that yeah 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 i i mean it was really quick exactly and i do the same when i've had negative supply send me stuff it's like dhl yeah. all the time and it gets here like the next day same with cat yeah, labs yeah. like they'll ship me stuff from boston on a friday and monday morning it's in my office and i'm like yeah. what like so yeah just so we're think, using DHL exclusively for this Kickstarter, and it's made everything so much. This isn't an advert for DHL. There are, there are other, <laughs> but they seem to have, they seem to have got this customs process down, and it yeah. makes it cheaper and easier for everyone. So yeah, that's important. That's what we'll do. Yeah. So like I said, like the Kickstarters that you said, uh, March nineteenth. March nineteenth, six p.m. GMT. GMT, which is the UK time, if I'm not wrong. Exactly. So you guys will be there. Yeah. So yeah, I'll I'll be leaving the links below to all of this, uh, you guys' website and um, all of that. How about the the zine and all that? Are you guys going to do a new edition? All the yeah. other cameras and things like, is there any other, pro like, let's like leave the Kickstarter once again on the side. Sure. Any other stuff to mention that will be coming or should we keep it for the news? And um, so we've got some accessories coming. So eight by 10 Fresnel screens, we had a bit of a problem with them. Uh, but we've changed the design. They're coming back in a few days. They're sold at the minute. And everyone who ordered one from us will send you one of the new ones for free because um, the other one worked, but it just wasn't quite good enough. It wasn't up to our usual standards. So we'll get this new one out to you for anyone who's listening who's got one of them. Um, what else have we got? We've got quite a few accessories coming. Um, recess lens boards, uh, top hat lens boards for all of our products. So you can use a wider variety of lens. It's sort of become increasingly hard to find uh, Linhof recess lens boards. People are charging an awful lot of money for the ones that are left. So we never like to see that. So we're going to make an affordable one. Um, what else is exciting? That's no, we've just been working on a lot of in house sort of efficiency stuff, um, particularly like quality control, making uh, everything, just making everything more efficient and sort of spotting mistakes earlier, things like that. And that's worked really well for four by fives. Um, so the four by five lead time, it still says five to six weeks on the website but i mean we're shipping some next day now so it's got right it's gone right down i don't know how long that'll last if we get more orders but so just kind of working on getting the lead times down things like that well you start being in store which is something i think you guys had always wanted one we've talked mm -hmm. multiple times over the years i can't remember how many times already but there's plenty <laughs> i'll leave a couple of links to previous yeah, interviews sure. and chats but like, I know one of the things was like, I would love to be able to catch up with orders so I can bulk make like 50 or 20 yeah. and send them to different stores. Yeah, now with this new relationship with the EU, I think it will be just like, we don't want our European customers. It'll be a lot easier for our European customers, I think, if they could buy it locally from a store or something in their country, then it just makes the whole VAT customs thing just disappear altogether. So um, yeah, it's definitely something we'll be interested in, but Every time I say we're getting to a stage, uh, we'll launch a new product or or we'll do a new zine or some sort of new advertising campaign and suddenly we get a load of orders again. But I mean, we like being able to do everything in-house. We have, uh, and we're very much an international company. Only like 20, 30% of what we sell goes to the UK, so. Okay, so, and you've also been yeah. selling film, which is interesting and supplying yes. film, which is, you know, yeah, you're doing the full circle not the full mm -hmm. circle, but pretty much the full circle. Is there anything like, will we see a technical, like I would, I was thinking, oh, now you're selling medium format, you know, in larger <laughs> or in 35. Will you think of making like a technical medium format? Because basically there's, you know, like a four by five, but a six by nine and so on, mm -hmm. which would use mini graph lock and you could use like RB, I mean, um, graphics, uh, 
backs or horsemen mm -hmm, backs? Mm -hmm. Like, is that something you've ever played with the idea? The tolerances there are much tighter because the smaller, sometimes it's more like yeah. complicated, but have you I thought mean, about that? The uh, the product you have sitting in front of you it's looks a, camera. a lot like it could be a medium format camera, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, you just have to make this like a graph lock and it's a medium yeah. format camera. We need a well, lens. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. So maybe. <laughs> maybe. I, maybe, we'll, we'll, maybe. We'll leave it there. Already, maybe we've already thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> I've the one. I'll tell you what I've been after. Like I've had this uh, gear acquisition syndrome for a little bit for like a monorail six by nine small camera. Mm. Yeah. And I'll, cool. I'll mention like the the two that I've seen. It's like the Arca Swiss or the Linhoff kind of style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like I love the idea of something small and gives me the film economy because it's getting to a point where one has to think about film economy too uh and mm -hmm. it's like i could shoot portra architectural stuff you know and get 10 yeah, shots in a roll and i i use i have like all the shift lenses they sell for medium format and i don't, I don't like <laughs> any of them in the point that they're really big and bulky and then it makes like a Mamiya RZ is really big. So yeah, uh, if you yeah. make one, even if it's a prototype, I'll be happy to test it out, especially when I'm in Finland and you know, uh, there'll be like buildings and trees. That's all. That's uh, yeah, yeah, buildings and trees. Yeah, you, you always end up with our prototypes, Nico. So I'm sure you'll, <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a go if yeah. you get there. But that's yeah, something we're definitely I'm... focusing on on darkroom for the next sort of 12 months. I think we're gonna have a big push into this new darkroom tech, see what we can come up with and get people printing. But yeah, as we're always thinking of exciting ideas for the future. So yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Max, for your time. Uh, I hope yeah, the Kickstarter goes well. Of course, it'll be on the news. Uh, mm -hmm. People will hear about it from different YouTube channels. So I'm sure nobody will be unnoticed of uh, your launch. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, good luck with that. And thank you for joining me, everyone. Leave a comment below. Uh, I'm sure Max will try to do some answers. He's also in my Discord yeah. for Patreon. So people get mm -hmm. one on one conversations with Max when he's got <laughs> five minutes every now and then. <laughs> Uh, if you like, uh, how do you say, like, um, mention him, he'll see it and then he'll come in and answer. Yes. So that's something, if you feel like becoming a patron, you got Max there. So he's a patron. So thank you, Max. Uh, no worries, and nothing. It. Thank you for everyone watching and see you in the next one. Bye. See ya.